Good morning, church. You lift up your eyes to the mountains. From whence comes our hope, our salvation, and from whom? From our Lord, our God. Thank you, Father. So we welcome you here today. I want to call your attention to the yellow box on, the, on your announcements that says the Spanish word of the week. The first word that we are going to learn, that we need to learn because it is, it says welcome to people as they come in, and we're going to learn this ahead of time so that we'll be ready. It's bienvenidos, okay? Bienvenidos, and it says welcome. Now, Evelyn, did I say that correctly? Bienvenidos. And I did put in there that you put your accent on the knee and that the D is like, okay, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Did I do it? Okay, let's all do that again. Bienvenidos. And I have a feeling that if somebody comes from our Hispanic neighborhood and you say, bienvenidos, I think they'll understand what you're saying and trying to say. So let's kind of, we'll work on this and we'll get a, a new word every now and then so that we will be ready when we start seeing our new people come in. Okay, we have a beautiful day today, a day to worship, and I see Becky here today and has brought somebody with her that we need to get to know. And um, will you ask him please to fill in the information slip so that we will have his information too. Because we like to welcome everybody. If you've not been here before, please fill that in. We have a new database where we're gonna try to keep track of everybody who's ever been here. And that way we can see if you've come back again or if you're new. And if you have not been to our new database on the internet, please do go and register and check in to see that your information is correct. Because guess what? Cheryl and I put the information in and once in a while we spell things wrong or we have old information and some people we didn't have your birthdays. So the, in the instructions are on the back apnaz.churchtrack.com you put in your email if it's already if we already had your email you should automatically get a code be able to go in and update your information if you if we don't have your email in there correctly then it'll send us a message that we can add your email and get it to where you can get in and check your information to make sure it's correct and then you can also print off a directory how about that Okay, and we will be printing directories from that information, so it's really important that you go in and make sure that yours is correct. Okay, thank you all. I'm going to turn the service over as we begin to worship the Lord, Daryl. Well, if you hadn't figured out from some of the uh, different neckties and funny hats, that we're being worn this morning. It is July 4th, and it is the day that we commemorate uh, our Declaration of Independence and uh, the birth of our nation. Tradition and uh, patriotism have the place. But for the church, we must always remember that we must not equate love of country, which I hope you have, but we must not equate love of country with love of God. Our first loyalty is to God's kingdom and then to anything else that follows. As citizens of God's kingdom, we seek to be good citizens of our nation. John Adams said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion, avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry, 
would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a small net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. He wrote that in a letter in 1798. Freedom must include responsibility and accountability. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So let's open with prayer for our nation. We thank you, Lord, for the privileges, the liberties that we have enjoyed as citizens of this nation. We have been blessed many times over simply because of where we live. And we thank you for those blessings. We also recognize, Lord, that our nation is no more perfect than any other, and we have much to be accountable for. We humbly ask, Lord, your forgiveness. For the sins of our nation are many. And foolishly, we have too often simply not followed your ways. And we have paid the price for it. Lord, we humbly ask that you would grant your church strength and courage to be the church as we live in this world in the time and place you have given us. Help our nation to be influenced by the good your church does rather than for us to be influenced by the things they do that are not so good. We ask your mercy and your guidance, especially as you have said in your word, for those in authority, so that they may lead us in the right way. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we begin singing this morning, God of our fathers. God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the skies our grateful songs before thy throne arise thy love divine hath led us in the past in this free land by thee our lot is cast chosen way from war's alarms from deadly pestilence be thy strong arm our ever sure defense thy true religion in our hearts in goodness nourish us in peace refresh thy people on their toil 
troublesome way. Lead us from night to never-ending day. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine. And glory, Lord, and praise be ever thine. Beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood From sea to shining sea O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet Whose stern impassioned stress A thoroughfare for freedom beat Across the wilderness America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful, for heroes prove in liberating strife. More than self, their country love, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness, and every gain divine. I will give thanks to Thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to Thee among the nations. For Thy steadfast love is great, is great, to the heavens and thy faithfulness thy faithfulness to the clouds be exalted O God above the heavens let thy glory Exalted, O oh God, above the heavens, let thy glory be over all the earth. It's the land of the free. It's a we didn't we didn't sing that one i know it we should sing the star bangle banner so we could stand up and be brave and be free are you brave austin are you free kaylee you think so what are you talking about brave and free well i'm free i can do anything i want because I live in the United States of America. You can. Anything you want. Yeah. Yeah. Because, Kaylee, if you want to kick your brother, you can do that, right? No. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's what being free means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It means that I'm free. I can do anything I want. 
Oh, now, is that what the Bible tells us? The Bible says, uh, free. The Bible says, believe in Jesus. He's the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, yeah, I understand. That is, that is what the Bible said. It does set you free. But what does it set you free from? Uh, um, I can uh, punch my sister. You can punch your sister. Austin, do you punch your sister? You don't. Kaylee, do you kick your brother? Petunia. But I want to, and I want to do it, and it's a free country. Yeah, it's a free country. I don't think that's what it means. And I don't think that's what Jesus meant when he said you're free. Then what did he say? He said, you are free to not have to read the law because he lives inside you. And he will help you live the law without having to learn it all. Do you think that's true? Can that be true? God can live in you? But he's a great big God. How come he's not sticking out in the air everywhere? Well, that is the miracle. That is a miracle how that great big God can be in you and in me and in Kylie, Kaylee, and, <laughs> and in Austin, and in Tommy, and in Tommy's friend, and in Randall, and in Sherry and Charlie, and me. Yes, and you. And can, Hey, do you know what? What? I was brave today. You were brave today. Yep. All those dick tickle, and I was so busy looking at the kids, I wasn't even scared of the dick tickle. Yeah. And did you feel free to talk to the kids? Yeah. And did you feel free to talk in front of the big people? Who do you think gave you that freedom? I think God. Yeah. He helps you because he lives in you. Isn't that a wonderful kind of freedom? Isn't it? To be free to listen to the spirit in you. I'm still listening. Yeah, and what does it say? It says, it says, I want to sit by Austin. Well, there is a chair there, so I will let you go ahead and sit there. And, but before I do, let's thank God. Thank you, God, that even though you're so big, you can fit inside me. Yes, Father, that you can be in us. And that we can just listen to you and do what you make us want to do. Because that is how we're free. We're free from having to do the hitting and kicking and punching and fighting. We're free to love. We're free to live like Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Patty. It is our offering time. And again, we thank you for your faithful giving to the church. Listen to these brief words from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. He says some very simple things. He says, be joyful always. That's a whole verse. <laughs> Not a bad one to memorize. If you have trouble memorizing things, you can memorize that one. <laughs> Be joyful always. Pray continually. 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. So as we give our tithes and offerings this morning, as you've done that when you come in, in our boxes at both entrances, as you do it perhaps on your way out, let us genuinely now give thanks to God for his blessings. Father, we do thank you for how you have worked in our lives in so many different ways that our blessings are beyond number. We would have a difficult time doing anything else this morning except simply trying to enumerate all the ways in which you have given to us. And so we thank you. And we're thankful that we can give in response to your giving to us for your love for us. And I thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of our people to do so, so carefully, regularly, in so many cases, sacrificially. And what we give now in your name, we give with the expectation, Lord, that you will bless what we give and make it useful in your work. For we pray these things in your name. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper together. In our church, we have what we call open communion. That means very simply, you don't have to be a member of the Church of the Nazarene to share in the Lord's Supper. If you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus alone for your salvation, and you're doing your best to live in obedience to His grace and His Word, you are welcome to participate in this sacrament. As you receive the elements when they're passed out, please hold on to them until everyone has received them so that we can take the Lord's Supper together. And I would encourage you, I know it takes some time to pass the elements out among the people, but as you're waiting, put your heart and mind in a spirit of prayer and communion with the Lord. God's Word instructs us to examine ourselves as we get ready to come to his table. So take that time to do so. It's private and personal. Nobody has to know your examination. <laughs> but examine yourself. Commune with God. Let him speak to your heart. And then, with a clear heart, participate fully in taking the Lord's Supper together. I'll ask those who are going to assist in distributing the elements to please come forward. As they are beginning that process, let me just remind you that it was in the same night that our Lord was betrayed that he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance for me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Since Jesus himself said to his disciples on that night, this is my body and this is my blood, we know the elements of bread and juice that we will soon share together are symbols. They do not physically become his body and blood, 
but they represent those very real things for us. For his body and blood were real. He came, God sent his Son in the form of mankind to be one of us, to redeem us. And so these elements represent the reality of Christ's life and death and resurrection for you and for me. Has everyone been served that wishes to participate this morning? Let us remember as we take these elements that God's Word reminds us that when we do this together in remembrance of Him, we are to remember not just His sacrifice, but He, was, he told us to remember these things until he comes. So we remember not only the sacrifice that took place, but that he is coming again for his church. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. cup represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. May it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance and be thankful. Lord, we are grateful for your sacrifice, for your life for your resurrection, for the promise of new life to us as we give our lives to you. May we do so, Lord, and draw closer to you each day. We ask in your name. Amen. Let us prepare for our time of prayer together by singing a little chorus.
in the presence of Jehovah. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, troubles vanish, hearts are mended. thanks for your presence for you have promised that you would be with us when we gather in your name specifically Lord in those moments you will be in our presence and we know Lord that you are listening as we come to you in prayer and we pray for one another help us Lord to be good encouragers of each other and especially when we know there are needs among us to be supportive in prayer and in whatever other ways we can be. As we look at the list that is provided for us week by week, we recognize there are many needs among us. There are many physical needs people who long to have a touch from you because of the things they are experiencing. And we ask, God, that you would bring your touch to their lives. We recognize that there will come a time for all of us when we will pass from this life into the next. And sometimes the physical difficulties of this life can make one long for this one to be over and the next to begin. But Lord, while we are here, give us grace that we may stay faithful to you, whatever our circumstances are. For we believe, Lord, that even when you do not choose a miraculous healing and touch on our bodies, you give us a special touch of your presence and your grace to strengthen us in the midst of our circumstances. So we pray that for each name on the list, and perhaps, Lord, for others that a variety of us may know individually, for the needs as we lift them to you as we know them. And Lord, we would not hesitate on this day especially to pray again for our nation and our culture which has drifted so far away from your ways and your truths. Lord, we, we ask your mercy. We've often heard the words, God bless America, and we do desire your blessing, but Lord, we cry out, God, have mercy on America. That we may turn from the ways that are so unlike yours and to recognize the value of your truths, of your moral laws. Help us, Lord. Have mercy on our nation. And help us to be 
the kind of people we need to be in the midst of this place you have us. We pray, Lord, for our pastor and his wife, and perhaps other family members as they are on vacation, and away from us, but not away from you. We pray that you would give them a good time of, of rest and rejuvenation. Bring them back to us, Lord, eager and ready to resume their duties here. May we each feel that sense of being restored week by week as we come here and worship together and not only speak to you as we sing and as we pray, but especially as we hear the words of the songs and our prayers and of your word. May we listen as you speak to us. For we ask these things in your name. Amen.
Well, thank you, ladies, for that. It must be nice to have talent. <laughs> I wish I had one. <clears throat> I wash dishes fairly well, but I, I'm not sure that qualifies. I actually have a nose flute somewhere. It's not like that one. And you probably wouldn't want to see me play it anyhow, so <clears throat> we'll leave that for another time. I'm going to be speaking to you for just a few moments this morning from 1 Peter chapter 2. And we'll start with verse 13. If you want to look that spot up in your Bibles as we look at God's Word together and consider some things related to Christian citizenship. 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, <clears throat> excuse me, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as to the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, but... If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. We are told in this passage and several others throughout God's Word to submit to governing authority. In a society such as ours, which has experienced a great deal of freedom and liberty, for which I trust we're thankful, when we see our government leading people in a harmful direction, we are inclined to push back, in fact, to resist. So the question arises, is that right? Or must we obey in all circumstances? This passage does give us some clear guidance. It is certainly not the only passage in God's Word, but it gives us good guidance. And first we begin with an understanding of the God-given role of government. It's important to understand what God intends good governing authority to be. And we have that at the very beginning of the passage we read here together, in particular in verse 14. It tells us the purpose of government is to punish wrong and commend those who are right. That seems simple enough. Not always so simple when it comes to carrying that out. But that's the purpose of government, to punish wrong and to commend those who do right. Chuck Colson stated it a little more comprehensively as he said this, including the other parts of God's Word as part of his understanding. The biblical view of the role of government is to preserve order, to restrain evil, and promote justice. That's the biblical role of government. He said, as he went on, government has no legitimate interest in running car companies or the health care system or taking over student loans and a whole lot of other stuff. The legitimate purpose 
as we understand it from God's word, is to preserve order, to restrain evil, to promote justice. Or as Peter says here, to punish wrong and commend those who do right. So there is a legitimate role for government to play in our lives, as much as sometimes we'd like to say, get out of my life, leave me alone. There is a legitimate role for government to play. But we know that all governments often exceed those limits or disregard them entirely. The issue for us is, what do we do then? When government is not doing things the way God intended them to do it, what do we do then? So we start out with understanding a proper purpose for government, but then we have to move on to the practice of Christians. What do we put into practice in our lives in response to whatever authority does for us? And while this passage doesn't tell us everything under the sun we need to know, it does again give us some good, clear guidance. And it starts by simply telling us that we are to do good. We know the difference between good and evil. We know the difference between right and wrong. We don't have any excuse about that, especially those of us who are in the church. And so we're told our first response, no matter what government does or doesn't do, our first response is you do good. Make that your first response as a follower of Jesus Christ. Be an example of doing what is right. And when you think about that and its importance, where else are people in our world, in our society, as we sit back and complain about all the things that are wrong and all the things that shouldn't be going on, where else is the rest of our society going to see a good example if they don't see it from us? So while it may seem like a, an oversimplification, I think Peter's point is an extremely valid one and good advice to us. The first response we should have is, you do good. Be a good example to those who are around you. We even need that to each other in the church. Several times in God's Word, He tells us to be an encouragement to one another and to pray for each other. All those things that we need from one another in the church. So, do good to your fellow believers. But don't stop there. We are to be a good example to those who are outside the church as well. So that's the first response we give as practicing Christians to the authority that is over us. Do good. The second one is not found here, but is also very, very important to us. We find it in the book of Acts, especially in chapter 5, along about verse 29, when he tells us that we are to obey God rather than man. Now, we have to be careful here, but he tells us we are to obey God rather than man. You see, the disciples had been out preaching and teaching, and the authorities didn't like it. That's sounding a little more familiar today than it once did around here, but they were really under the gun from the authorities that simply did not want to hear the message they were preaching. And people were being responsive and listening and becoming part of the church. And so they arrested them threw them in jail. Now God had a different idea of what ought to happen in that particular occasion, so he did something very unusual, spectacular, miraculous. He opened the doors of the jail so that they could walk out. I think if this happens to you, you may want to find a good bonds bail person instead. I don't think the doors are going to swing open necessarily. This was a rare occasion. But God let them out of jail. And what did they do? They went right back to the temple area and began to preach and teach again. And somebody said, you know, you go, 
go check on those people we put in jail, and they went and checked. And they had to come back and say, uh, <clears throat> they're not there. <laughs> but we've heard they're out preaching in the temple area. So they sent their guards back a second time and brought them in. They, they did it um, very courteously. They were a little concerned about the crowds and what they might do. But they brought them in again for questioning. And they told them, you've got to stop this. We want you to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. And that gets you to Acts 5.29, where Peter says, we can't. We can't. We know you're the governing authority, but we must obey God rather than man. Now, as I said, we need to be careful here. There are folks in the church who often say, well, God told me to do this, and God told me to do that, and sometimes the things they're telling other people that God told them to do sound a little personal to me. We need to be careful, especially when we tell others what God has told us to do, make sure it lines up with the word of God which we know. God may tell you to do something personally, and if it's really Him, then obey God. Be careful what you tell others if it's not coming out of here. <laughs> yes, God does speak to us and give us direction. But the direction He give us, gives us personally is never going to be contrary to the truth that He's already given us in His Word. Peter had to say on that day, what you're doing as the governing authority, I simply can't follow. I have to obey God rather than man. So we are to do right, and we, we are to obey God. I would add a small addition to that second principle. You won't find it in God's word explicitly. It is implied. Obey God and be prepared for the consequences. They obeyed God. Did that suddenly make life easy for them? It did not. In fact, on a whole number of occasions, it made life a lot harder for them. So don't think that somehow if I obey God, God's going to just open the floodgates and, and it'll be smooth sailing. I'll just be able to skate right down the middle of the road, no problems. That's not the example we have out of the New Testament. They were thrown in jail. They were run out of town. The whole church was scattered out of Jerusalem. Some were killed because of their willingness to obey God rather than man. Do good. Obey God. Be prepared for the consequences. That's the Christian response. And it follows a very important principle. Here's the thing that guides all of this. It comes at the very end of the passage that we read together. That last verse that we read, verse 21, provides for us the guiding principle for all of this. And it's very simple. It's the principle of Christ-likeness. What does he say? Verse 21, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Jesus despises sin. He was often harsh with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. But he did not hate the Pharisees. He threw the merchants out of the temple area, but he did not hate the merchants. It's important to understand Christ-likeness. I read something on Facebook recently from an old college friend of mine. It went like this. 
If you march shouting death to America, or all cops must die, you are my enemy. And my first thought was, and do you love your enemy? It didn't sound very loving to me. We may have to take a stand for what is right and be prepared for the consequences of that, but the principle is Christ-likeness. Not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of God's moral law to be like Him. The idea that we would be obnoxious and have a hateful tone to our rhetoric, whether on social media or in personal interaction with people, is utterly beyond the pale. It is not Christ-likeness. How in the world are we going to set the good example that we're supposed to be setting if our tone is brash, harsh, divisive? We're to be, as we've already heard the word this morning, welcoming. Paul said on one occasion, I seek to persuade men. The principle is Christ's likeness. Both Peter and Paul in their writings recognize slavery as a fact of life in their world. Peter does here. Some people misunderstood that and think, well, well, the gospel must be condoning slavery. No, it does not. Be clear about that. It absolutely does not. It simply recognized this was going on in the world and some of the people who were going to be followers of Jesus were going to be those who found themselves in a position of servitude and slavery. But they could still be followers of God in the very worst of circumstances. He simply gave them advice as to how to live for Christ under the worst of conditions. He noted that Paul in particular also advised those who were slaves to gain their freedom if they could. You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let us be clear in the church. Slavery and its leftover racism has no place in God's church. Amen. We will not be part of it. principle is Christ's likeness. We are to act in a manner consistent with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We cannot un justify unrighteous means even to achieve what we may think are righteous ends. Being poor, for example, does not justify welfare fraud. Mm -hmm. Knowing that your tax money is being wasted doesn't justify cheating on your taxes. One thing doesn't lead to the other. We must be consistent in our walk with Christ. Even those who murder the unborn does not justify murdering or even hating those who do such things. We are to have mercy and extend grace and forgiveness to everyone. And it won't always be easy. But the principle is Christ's likeness. Follow the example of Christ even unto suffering. Verse 21, For Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. Amen. Even though presently non-Christians may oppose us, condemn us, falsely accuse us, I hope it's falsely, and perhaps even persecute us, we are to follow the admonition of a verse here in 1 Peter that we did not read. It was just prior to where we started. 
in verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He tells us, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. There it is. Want to know how to live in this world? Government has a role to play. It has a proper authority. But I guarantee you it will exceed that authority. It will do things it shouldn't do. It will not do things it should. And as you stand up for Jesus and His ways and His principles and His truths, you may have to be ready to accept the consequences. But live such good lives that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, there will come a day when they will have to stand and say, we knew it was right all along. We saw it. We saw the good example. They live the life of Christ in front of us that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. May it be so of the church in today's world. For the rest of our world needs to see that yes. from us. We're going to close this morning by singing a song that helps us to focus on those very issues. song says, God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. We do need his power and his strength to do what we need to do, to be a good example, to do good, to do what's right, to be willing even to suffer, but to live such good lives the rest of the world won't have any choice except to glorify God on the day He comes. Let's sing verse 1. God of grace. circumstances, good or bad, may we be your people and live a good example before those around us. We pray in your name. Amen.